Our story begins in the iconic city of Boston, Massachusetts, circa 1912. Amongst the chime of church bells and a dense morning fog, we discover a formidable figure, a young Joseph P. Kennedy Sr. He's a man on the cusp of an extraordinary journey, preparing to orchestrate a family ascension from humble roots to the pinnacle of American wealth. Poised against the backdrop of the Boston Harbor, he watches as ships dock and depart, while his ambitions mirror the bold journeys of these picturesque vessels. The son of Irish immigrants, Kennedy stands alone, engulfed by the tumultuous symphony of the city. A young man living at the confluence of past struggles and future aspirations, Joe's heart pulses with the rhythm of a dream to transform his lineage from humble newcomers into esteemed members of the old money elite in the heights of American wealth and influence. It should come as no surprise that despite early controversy, subsequent success and heartbreaking tragedy, Joseph P. Kennedy Sr. did indeed accomplish his dream of transforming his burgeoning bootleg liquor business into one of the foremost families synonymous with the concept of an American aristocracy. In today's video at Old Money Luxury, we shall tell the tale, regaling the ups and downs like a schooner riding the Boston Harbor waves, and describe how the Kennedy family went from new money to old money. The dawn of the 20th century saw the ambitious Joseph P. Kennedy Sr., a son of Irish immigrants, embarking on his unprecedented journey towards the zenith of American wealth and power in Boston. His trajectory traversed the murky avenues of bootlegging, the unpredictable whirlwind of the stock market, the vast expanse of real estate, and the dazzling limelight of Hollywood. In 1919, as the 18th Amendment was ratified, initiating the era of prohibition, Kennedy sensed a golden opportunity in America's insatiable appetite for liquor. With rumored ties to organized crime figures, he allegedly established a sprawling network of bootlegging operations that churned out massive profits under the radar of law enforcement. The clandestine endeavor, while questionable, laid a robust financial foundation for the future Kennedy fortune. At the same time, in the roaring 1920s, Kennedy ventured into the volatile realm of Wall Street, Armed with an uncanny intuition for profitable enterprises, he made a series of lucrative investments, capitalizing on the bull market of the era. For instance, in 1928, Kennedy purchased Pantage's Theater Company, a chain of movie theaters for $8 million, only to sell it a year later for a handsome profit of $15 million. His keen foresight shone brightly when, sensing an impending economic downturn, he astutely liquidated most of his stock portfolio by 1929, just before the infamous Wall Street crash. This strategic move not only shielded his wealth from the widespread financial devastation occurring in the United States at the time, but also exponentially multiplied it, as he bought back stocks at rock-bottom prices during the Great Depression. Joseph's adventures in real estate further contributed to his financial ascendance. In the mid-1920s, he started investing in commercial real estate properties. He bought the Somerset Hotel in Boston in 1926 and went on to acquire several other high-profile properties over the next decade, amassing a significant real estate portfolio. Throughout the late 1920s and early 1930s, he steadily expanded his real estate holdings, notably in New York City. One of his most significant real estate transactions was the purchase and subsequent leasing of the iconic Manhattan building at 14 Wall Street in 1929 for an impressive profit. Meanwhile, the lure of Hollywood beckoned Kennedy westward in the late 1920s. He assumed control of several movie production studios, including the famed FBO Studios, which he later sold to Radio Corporation of America, RCA, in 1929 for $4.6 million forming part of what is now known as RKO Pictures. These remarkable accomplishments were the cornerstones of the Kennedy family's transition from humble immigrant roots to new money. Unlike old money dynasties, the new money elite, such as the Kennedys, acquired their wealth within a generation. Through entrepreneurial drive, investment prowess, and a little Hollywood magic, Joseph P. Kennedy Sr. managed to carve out a formidable financial empire. In just a couple of decades, Joseph P. Kennedy Sr. had not merely built a financial empire, he had nurtured a dream, a vision for his offspring to transcend the realm of commerce and leave a lasting imprint on the annals of American political history. This ambition was not merely limited to his own life, it was a vision he ardently desired for his lineage. 
a dynasty that would not just revel in material wealth, but would etch its name in the golden ledger of American political history. To actualize his vision, he invested heavily in the intellectual grooming of his offspring. The Kennedy children were privy to an educational milieu that was the envy of many. Harvard, Stanford and Radcliffe were all touchpoints in their academic journey. These revered institutions were the crucibles where the Kennedy sons and daughters were molded, preparing them for the great leap into public life. Joseph Kennedy Jr., the eldest of the Kennedy brood, was initially envisioned as the political torchbearer of the family. However, his sudden death in 1944 during World War II tragically upended this plan. The mantle then fell to his younger brother, the charismatic and intellectually astute John F. Kennedy. Fresh from his heroic stint as a naval officer in World War II and a brief foray into journalism, JFK was ready to embrace his destiny in the political arena. His electoral debut materialized in 1946 when he won a seat in the U.S. House of Representatives for Massachusetts's 11th congressional district. This victory marked the beginning of an illustrious political trajectory, a journey that would elevate the Kennedy name from mere millionaires to an enduring political dynasty. As JFK's star began to rise, so too did the realization of Joseph P. Kennedy Sr.'s dream. JFK's charisma, youthful energy, and his family's significant financial resources quickly made him a political force to be reckoned with. He ascended to the U.S. Senate in 1952, defeating incumbent Henry Cabot Lodge Jr., a victory largely attributed to the powerful campaign machinery funded by the Kennedy wealth. The crowning glory, however, came on November 8, 1960. JFK, against all odds, won the presidential election, defeating Vice President Richard Nixon in one of the closest races in American history. His presidency was not merely a victory for the Kennedys, it was the fulfillment of Joseph P. Kennedy Sr.'s dream. The first Irish Catholic president, JFK, represented the culmination of the Kennedy journey from Irish immigrants to the peak of American political power. However, it is important to note that the Kennedy wealth played an instrumental role throughout this journey. It allowed the family to influence media, fund robust campaigns, and navigate the expansive landscape of American politics. The financial resources underpinned the Kennedys' political ascendancy, enabling them to engage at par with America's old money elite, whose members had traditionally held the reins of American wealth and political power. Now, from the very start, the Kennedys, despite their new money roots, sought to weave themselves into the exclusive fabric of American society. They aimed to emulate the old money attributes, elite education, refined leisure activities, strategic alliances, and most importantly, a cultivated image of effortless grace and affluence. Education was the first step. Joseph P. Kennedy Sr. ensured that his children received an education that matched the country's finest, focusing on Ivy League institutions like Harvard. The family's summers were spent at their estate in Hyannisport, Massachusetts, a picturesque seaside community popular with America's wealthy elite. These leisure traditions were reminiscent of old money family practices, subtly integrating the Kennedys into this elite circle. Furthermore, the Kennedys understood the power of strategic intermarriage, which serves as a crucial mechanism for many families in their quest to consolidate power and secure their standing within the echelons of society. One means of accomplishing this was by aligning with established old money families as they brought to the union not only their substantial wealth, but also the respect and prestige associated with their lineage. These connections could significantly reinforce the family's societal standing and further cement their place among the elite. This strategy became notably apparent when a member of the Kennedy family, John F. Kennedy, tied the knot with Jacqueline Bouvier in 1953. The Kennedys, despite their considerable wealth and political clout, were often seen as new money. Thus, aligning with an old money family was a strategic move to gain social legitimacy and acceptance among the American upper crust. Jacqueline Bouvier was the epitome of old money. She hailed from a distinguished lineage on the East Coast, with roots tracing back to the early French immigrants in America. The Bouviers had accumulated their wealth over generations, built significant social ties, and were part of the country's established elite. 
Unlike new money families, the Bouviers didn't just have wealth. They were woven into the social fabric of the nation's influential circles. Jacqueline's upbringing was steeped in the luxuries and privileges associated with her family's social status. She was exposed to an elite education, had an appreciation for fine arts, and exhibited a cultured refinement, traits that were typically associated with old money families. Her distinct upbringing and the prestige of the Bouvier name beautifully complemented the ambition and political aspirations of the Kennedy family. By marrying Jacqueline, John F. Kennedy didn't just gain a life partner. He secured a union that helped further validate the Kennedy's place among the societal elite. It served to blend the vigorous dynamism of the new money Kennedy family with the established grace and respect of the old money Bouviers, contributing to a powerful and influential legacy. Thus, as the First Lady, Jackie Kennedy played a pivotal role in crafting the family's image. Her innate grace, sophisticated style and cultured intellect helped cultivate an image of the Kennedys as an old money family. She masterfully employed her background to shape the Kennedy narrative, enhancing their status through her impeccable fashion sense, her refined taste in arts and her sophisticated social graces. In the Grand White House, she was instrumental in numerous restoration projects, making it a symbol of cultured elegance and a celebration of American history. This not only amplified her personal stature, but also fortified the Kennedy image as an American dynasty, subtly blending the lines between new money and old money. Through education, strategic alliances, and a carefully curated family image, the Kennedys began to mirror the qualities of the old money elite. It was an audacious endeavor, one that added another layer to their intriguing narrative, further blurring the lines between the realms of new money and old money. The term Camelot, a mythical kingdom known for its idyllic aura and noble ideals, was applied to the Kennedy administration, painting their reign with an enchanting gloss. This imagery invoked after JFK's tragic assassination played a significant role in furthering the Kennedy family's old money image and profoundly impacted American culture. The Camelot myth hails from Arthurian legend, where King Arthur ruled with justice, wisdom, and a round table of noble knights. When Jackie Kennedy referenced Camelot in a post-assassination interview with Life magazine, she likened her husband's administration to this fabled kingdom. The metaphor stuck, casting a near-mythical aura around the Kennedy presidency. This Camelot imagery aligned seamlessly with the old money image that the Kennedys were cultivating. Like the legendary kingdom, old money was associated with sophistication, refined taste, and noble birth. Additionally, Camelot is an image that is historically connected with the royalty of England and the Anglo-Saxon mythos, which in the United States is often seen as the realm of the old money Anglo-American elite. To connect an Irish immigrant family with the Anglo-Saxon canon would further cement and blur the lines between who could become old money in the new 20th century America. Thus, the Camelot metaphor served to further cement the Kennedy image as a new form of American dynasty, embodying the grandeur and noble ideals that were traditionally associated with the country's old money elite. With this, the Kennedy presidency brought a sense of glamour and aspiration to the White House. Jackie's fashion choices were emulated by women across the nation, while JFK's charisma and optimism resonated with the American youth, fostering a sense of hope and progress. The focus on arts and culture during their tenure, including the establishment of the National Endowment for the Arts, elevated the nation's cultural landscape, echoing the old money appreciation for high culture. Lastly, the Camelot image also had a profound impact on subsequent political campaigns, with future candidates attempting to replicate the charisma and hope that JFK's presidency represented. The Kennedy administration set a new benchmark for political communication, using television and other media to create a relatable, aspirational image. Therefore, the Kennedys' Camelot and its pervasive influence served to further integrate them into the realm of old money. It marked a significant chapter in the Kennedy narrative, merging politics, culture and social status into a compelling American saga. Sadly, as with any multi-generation dynasty, the Kennedys' story isn't solely composed of triumphs and victories. 
It is also marked by a series of notable scandals and tragedies, often referred to as the Kennedy Curse. However, it's their stoic, dignified reactions to these trials that have further cemented their place within the old money law, demonstrating resilience characteristic of long-standing noble families. The litany of tragedies began with Joseph Kennedy Jr.'s untimely demise during World War II, followed by the shocking assassination of JFK in 1963, and later, Robert Kennedy's assassination in 1968. Scandals, too, were not unfamiliar to the family, the most notable being Ted Kennedy's Chappaquiddick incident in 1969. Yet each tragedy was met with a dignified stoicism that spoke volumes of the family's resilience. They maintained a composed public facade, handling these crises with the grace and strength that many came to associate with the Kennedys. This stoicism was reflective of old money families, who traditionally have navigated the tumultuous waves of fortune with a level-headed demeanor and a stiff upper lip. Moreover, despite these tragedies, the Kennedys never wavered from their ambitions. They continued to strive for political, social and cultural influence, maintaining their family's prominence within American society. They stayed committed to their causes, from civil rights to education and healthcare, thus ensuring that their legacy transcended the personal tragedies they endured. Jackie Kennedy, in particular, demonstrated extraordinary resilience in the face of adversity. Her poise and strength after JFK's assassination left a deep impression on the American public, further enhancing the family's connection to old money, stoic resilience. In the contemporary world of wealth and politics, the Kennedy family continues to exert significant influence, both as symbols of American political heritage and active participants in public service. Their story is one of resilience and relentless ambition, maintaining their place in the American consciousness. Several members of the newer generations of Kennedys have carried forward the family's tradition of public service. Joseph P. Kennedy III, JFK's grandnephew, served as a congressman from Massachusetts, while his twin brother Matthew has been active in non-profit work. The late Swearsha Kennedy Hill, a granddaughter of Robert Kennedy, was a vocal mental health advocate. However, despite their enduring political engagement, the family's prominence in the world of wealth has somewhat diminished. While they remain affluent, the scale of their wealth doesn't match the likes of today's billionaire magnates. Yet this does not undermine their standing as one of America's foremost political dynasties. Their name carries weight in history, tragedy and triumph that money alone cannot buy. In the context of new money versus old money today, the Kennedys occupy a unique position. While they originated as new money, their calculated moves, strategic alliances and cultivated image have led them to be perceived as old money. Their lineage, coupled with their long-standing involvement in American society and politics, grants them an aura of illustrious heritage and permanence, akin to the old wealth families of the East Coast. However, the Kennedy saga has not been immune to controversy, an element that sometimes jarringly contrasts their old money aspirations. A compelling example is the figure of Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who deviates from the stoic elegance associated with old money and instead embodies the boisterous audacity often linked with new money. RFK Jr.'s outspoken nature and activism, while celebrated by many, can be perceived as a reflection of the Kennedys' enduring new money energy. That flame of ambition, kindled by their patriarch Joseph P. Kennedy Sr., continues to burn fiercely in the Kennedy lineage, often manifesting in their dogged pursuit of entrepreneurial ventures and unwavering dedication to public service. The Kennedys, therefore, personify an intriguing synthesis of new money zeal and old money refinement. They are a living example of a quintessential American narrative, a narrative where a family can ascend from humble immigrant beginnings to the towering peaks of social influence and political power. In the riveting saga of the Kennedys, one can observe an evolving blend of new and old, a constant striving for higher realms, a steadfast adherence to their heritage, all underlined by an indomitable spirit to carve their place in history. In common American parlance, the name Kennedy often conjures images of graceful elegance in the face of tragedy, a bold new frontier, and an unbridled American optimism.
Yet, for those with a discerning eye, it should also emit thoughts of a rich and dynamic architectural legacy in the history of the United States. Indeed, the Kennedy name is not just a byword for political legacy. It additionally serves as a gateway to some of the most fascinating and historically significant properties in the United States. These properties, with their distinct architectural styles and the myriad of earth-shattering events they've housed, offer a unique lens through which to view the Kennedy saga. One where bricks and mortar are as eloquent as the speeches and policies that emanated from these illustrious dwellings. In today's episode of Old Money Mansions, we'll give you the grand tour of the iconic properties of the Kennedys, discussing both the architectural nuances and design decisions of one of America's most iconic families. With that said, let us begin with perhaps the home most intimately connected to the Kennedy name. Number 1. The Kennedy Compound, Hyannisport, Massachusetts. In the tranquil seaside town of Hyannisport, Massachusetts, sits the Kennedy Compound, a sprawling estate and without a doubt the most famous Kennedy Mansion, barring the White House itself. Overlooking the azure waves of Nantucket Sound, Joseph P. Kennedy, the father of JFK and the many other luminary Kennedy scions, first laid eyes on the main house in 1928 and quickly transformed it into the Kennedy family's beloved summer retreat. This quaint summer cottage, first erected in 1904, underwent a transformation under Joseph's vision, morphing into a haven for the Kennedy children. Here, in the sun-drenched days of summer, the nine siblings engaged in sailing and spirited sports, crafting memories in the breezy climes of Massachusetts. And its evolution was marked by the acquisition of two additional properties by Joseph's sons, John F. Kennedy and Robert F. Kennedy, which contributed to the compound's expansion into a three-house complex. Then, the 1960s marked a transformative era for the compound, seeing it evolve from a mere family retreat to a crucial stage for political machinations. John F. Kennedy, whose childhood summers were spent within these walls, utilized it as his campaign nerve center during the 1960 presidential race. In the years of his presidency, the compound was a gathering point for international dignitaries, emblematic of the Kennedy's burgeoning political legacy. And architecturally, the compound is a nod to the classic Cape Cod style. The main house, with its white clabbered facade, stands as the centerpiece of the estate. Spanning 9,000 square feet, this grand structure houses 12 bedrooms and is adorned with sprawling porches that offer breathtaking ocean views. And its interior, featuring four reception rooms and an expansive kitchen, has played host to numerous Kennedy gatherings, resonating with the echoes of jubilant family events and significant political discussions. But over time, the compound saw even further expansion. John F. Kennedy's acquisition of a neighboring house in 1956, followed by Robert F. Kennedy's purchase of an adjacent property, augmented its grandeur. With Edward Kennedy's acquisition in 1959, the estate now comprises three full-sized houses, guest quarters, and two circular driveways, all harmoniously blending into a seamless whole. And the compound, despite its grandeur and historical significance, has always prioritized comfort and hospitality. It has served dual roles, a sanctuary for the Kennedy family and a stage for momentous political events, including its stint as a summer White House during John F. Kennedy's presidency. Later, in a poignant act of philanthropy, the main house of the Kennedy compound was donated to the Edward M. Kennedy Institute for the United States Senate in 2012. This gesture, honoring a promise made by Senator Edward Kennedy to his mother, Rose, ensured that the family home would continue to serve the public. The Institute plans to utilize the house for educational programs and seminars, with aspirations of eventually opening it to the public. This noble act, orchestrated by Senator Ted Kennedy's widow, Victoria Kennedy, and supported by a generous $3.2 million donation from the Committee to Re-elect Edward M. Kennedy Campaign Fund, ensures the preservation of this historic site for future generations. Number 2. The Kennedy White House, Washington, D.C. Now, in the early 1960s, the United States witnessed a defining era under the presidency of John F. Kennedy. The White House, during this period from 1961 to 1963, was not just a residence but a vibrant hub of American politics, bustling with activity and embodying the spirit of the Kennedy administration. This was a time marked by notable presidential events and state affairs, including the Bay of Pigs invasion, the Berlin crisis, and the initiation of the Apollo space program. 
all echoing Kennedy's commitment to confronting global challenges. Amidst the political fervor, the White House experienced a transformation of a different kind under the discerning eye of First Lady Jacqueline Kennedy. Her restoration project was more than a redecoration, it was a reverent nod to the past. Enlisting the expertise of decorator Dorothy Parrish, Jacqueline Kennedy embarked on a mission to imbue the White House with historical authenticity and elegance. This project, surpassing its initial budget constraints, was fueled by her unwavering determination to source antiques and family heirlooms, reflecting a deep respect for America's heritage. Jacqueline Kennedy's restoration vision transcended mere aesthetics. She believed that each artifact and design element should resonate with historical significance, aiming to preserve the White House as a living museum of American history. This commitment was vividly showcased in her televised tour of the White House in 1962, drawing public admiration and further cementing the project's success. And this tour not only highlighted her dedication to historical preservation, but also marked a pivotal moment in how the American public viewed the White House. The event, reaching millions of viewers, brought the nation's heritage into living rooms across the country, fostering a deeper connection between Americans and this iconic architectural symbol of their government. Additionally, the broadcast, celebrated for its elegance and educational value, set a precedent for future First Ladies and administrations to engage with the public in similar ways, integrating media and heritage. Indeed, it elevated the White House from a mere executive residence to a cherished national landmark, intertwining its image with that of American identity and history. And her efforts in this restoration and tour significantly influenced the perception of the White House in popular culture making it a symbol of both historical reverence and public accessibility. Furthermore, the impact of Jackie Kennedy's restoration was profound, enhancing the White House's aesthetic allure and historical depth. It was a symbol of her dedication to historical preservation, ensuring the White House mirrored the nation's rich cultural fabric. And beyond the restoration, the Kennedy White House left an unforgettable mark on American history and culture. John F. Kennedy, with his youthful energy and charismatic presence, alongside Jacqueline Kennedy's elegance and cultural sophistication, represented a new era in American politics. They brought a fresh, optimistic perspective to the White House, contrasting sharply with the more conservative administrations before them. The Kennedys also infused the White House with cultural vitality, making it a showcase for the arts and solidifying their commitment to preserving American history and culture. The establishment of the White House Historical Association by Jacqueline Kennedy remains a lasting legacy of this commitment. Therefore, the White House under Kennedy became a symbol of elegance and sophistication, intertwined with a newfound charisma, media astuteness, and a profound connection with the arts and culture. Number three, the Winter White House, Palm Beach, Florida. In the sun-drenched landscape of Palm Beach, Florida, a remarkable architectural gem known as the Kennedy Winter White House gracefully occupies its place in history. This majestic estate, with its Mediterranean flair and opulent features, first came into prominence in 1933 when Joseph P. Kennedy, the aforementioned patriarch of the Kennedy family, acquired it as a winter retreat for a sum of $110,000. And this purchase wasn't just an iconic example of Kennedy's discerning eye, but also a strategic move, planting the family flag in one of America's most luxurious locales. The estate, with its enviable oceanfront location, offered more than just a panoramic view of the Atlantic. It was a sanctuary where the waves' rhythmic lullabies mixed with the rustle of palm leaves. The sprawling grounds, adorned with a sparkling swimming pool and meticulously maintained tennis courts, were a microcosm of Palm Beach's grandeur. Here, the Kennedys could bask in the privacy and luxury that only such a property could afford. As the years passed, the estate grew in historical stature, particularly during the tenure of John F. Kennedy. Under his ownership, this elegant mansion transformed into a winter domicile for the president, earning the moniker the Winter White House. It was within these walls that Kennedy, away from the public eye, penned significant portions of his Pulitzer Prize-winning book, Profiles in Courage, and later, his iconic 1961 inaugural address. The estate was also a discreet nerve center for political dealings, equipped with direct communication lines to the White House, underscoring its importance during pivotal moments of Kennedy's presidency. Architecturally, the estate is a marvel, 
originally designed in 1923 by the legendary Addison Meisner for Rodman Wanamaker. And the Kennedy touch is evident in the careful renovations and expansions carried out under their aegis. The senior Kennedy, understanding the importance of maintaining the property's architectural integrity, entrusted Maurice Fatio with its renovation. And these modifications were sensitive to Misner's vision, while incorporating modern comforts and amenities, including an expanded family room, upgraded tennis court, and a larger swimming pool. The story of the estate continued to evolve, with the Palm Beach Landmarks Preservation Commission approving further renovations in 2021, signaling a continued dedication to preserving its historical and architectural essence. These updates, encompassing both interior and exterior aspects, were designed to harmonize with the property's rich legacy as a cornerstone of architectural beauty and historical significance. Number 4. The Kennedy Residence, New York City In the luminous skyline of New York City, within the Upper East Side's legendary elegance, the Kennedy Residence at 1045th Avenue emerges as a beacon of grace and historical depth. Acquired in 1964 by Jacqueline Kennedy, this 15th floor penthouse became her haven after President Kennedy's tragic assassination. This move signified a poignant shift in her journey and forever connected her story with the complex architectural heritage of New York City. And the residence's address on Fifth Avenue is more than just a location. It's a statement. Overlooking Central Park, it offers a stunning panorama that epitomizes Manhattan's upscale urban charm. For 30 years, until her passing in 1994, this was Jacqueline Kennedy's domain, where she infused her surroundings with her characteristic poise and elegance. Entering the residence, we're immediately struck by the sophisticated interior, speaking to Jacqueline Kennedy's impeccable taste and love for aesthetics. Each room, from the five luxurious bedrooms with their private bathrooms to the common areas, reflects an air of sophisticated opulence. The apartment, graced with herringbone floors, towering ceilings, a wood-panelled library, and cosy wood-burning fireplaces stands as a masterpiece of interior design. And beyond its aesthetic allure, the apartment's historical significance is profound. It symbolizes Jacqueline Kennedy's resilience and her enduring dedication to preserving America's cultural legacy. Her influence, so vividly felt within these walls, extended to the city of New York itself. She was a fervent advocate for historic preservation, a mission she passionately pursued, safeguarding landmarks such as Grand Central Terminal and St. Bartholomew's Church. Following Jacqueline Kennedy's era, the apartment witnessed several changes in ownership, each contributing to its storied past. David Koch became a subsequent owner, and in 2006, Glenn Dubin purchased the residence for $32 million. It then passed to Thomas and Marjorie Lerman in 2016, who bought it from Edgar Bronfman Jr. in 2008 for a record $32.5 million, barking on a comprehensive renovation. Today, the Kennedy residence stands not merely as a home, but as a living homage to Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis's enduring legacy, a space where her spirit of elegance, resilience, and cultural stewardship continues to resonate. Number 5. Hickory Hill, Virginia in the lush, verdant landscapes of McLean, Virginia, the iconic estate Hickory Hill was acquired by Robert and Ethel Kennedy in 1955 and has since woven itself into the fabric of the nation's history. Its journey from a private family residence to a crucible of social and political discourse embodies the transformative power of interior space and legacy, and its purchase by the Kennedys mirrors crucial epochs in the broader story of the United States. You see, it was a time of burgeoning American optimism, and the couple's choice of residence was symbolic of their aspirations and status. The Georgian-style mansion, with its imposing red brick facade, embodies a classic elegance, and its architectural design harmonizes grandeur with intimacy, a perfect setting for a family known for their public service and private charisma. The mansion's interiors, marked by spacious rooms and elegant decorations, reflect a bygone era of sophistication, an ambience that the Kennedys would later imbue with their own unique style. And during the 1960s, Hickory Hill transformed from a mere residence into a vibrant hub of intellectual and political activity. Specifically, it was in these hallowed halls that the famous Hickory Hill seminars were held. Organized by historian and Kennedy family insider Arthur Schlesinger Jr., 
These gatherings brought together a who's who of American thought leaders. Politicians, legal minds, journalists, academics and artists convened under the Kennedy's roof, engaging in spirited discussions that shaped the contours of American policy and culture. Thus, these seminars were more than just elite social gatherings. They were a melting pot of ideas and ideologies, setting the stage for profound societal shifts. As the Kennedy era came to a close, Hickory Hill passed into new hands, yet its legacy remained untarnished. Purchased in 2009 by tech entrepreneur Alan J. Dabier, the estate's transition did little to diminish its historical and cultural significance. And despite contemporary renovations, the essence of Hickory Hill has been preserved with utmost care. These preservation efforts ensure that Hickory Hill remains a living piece of history, allowing future generations to experience the legacy of a family that played a pivotal role in shaping modern America. And the estate now stands as a national historic landmark, a tribute to the impact the Kennedy family left on American society and politics. When we think of the Kennedy name, our minds often conjure images of classiness, grace, noblesse oblige, and the refined aura of old money. This connection is typically linked to President John F. Kennedy's educational background and his suave, handsome appearance. But where does this old money ethos within the famed Kennedy lineage truly stem from? Surprisingly, most often it originates not from Jack Kennedy, but rather from the Kennedy women. In today's episode of Old Money Luxury, we'll present a fascinating historical thesis on the nature of how the old money ethos is formed in one of America's most iconic dynasties and explain how the women of the Kennedy family created the old money Kennedy ethos. We must, of course, start with the matriarch, Rose Elizabeth Fitzgerald Kennedy. Born on the 22nd of July, 1890, in Boston, Massachusetts, Rose was the pride and joy of John F. Fitzgerald, also known as Honey Fitz, and Mary Josephine Hannon Fitzgerald, marking the beginning of a legacy that would shape American politics for generations. Now, John F. Fitzgerald, her father, wasn't just a household name in Boston, he was a titan of the national political arena, gracing the Massachusetts State Senate, the U.S. House of Representatives, and even the esteemed office of the mayor of Boston. And growing up, Rose was no stranger to old money connections. Her educational journey saw her attend elite schools in the Netherlands and Dorchester, Massachusetts. But it wasn't just her schooling that set her apart. It was her early foray into the world of politics. At the tender age of 16, she became her father's shadow, accompanying him to public functions, a role typically reserved for her more reserved mother. You see, the Fitzgeralds were the very embodiment of the lace-curtain Irish-American community in Boston. Their wealth and status didn't just give them a seat at the table, it gave them the power to shape the table itself. They were at the forefront of the Irish Democratic takeover in Boston, a movement that sent shockwaves through the Yankee Republicans, who saw Fitzgeraldism, as it was known, as a threat to their traditional hold over the city. And thus, it was during her teenage years that Rose's path crossed with Joseph Patrick Joe Kennedy. However, their families, both vacationing in Maine, were unaware that this meeting would intertwine their destinies forever. Joseph P. Kennedy Sr. was even then an embodiment of ambition, and he fashioned himself as a businessman with an insatiable thirst for power, a quest that gave him a vision to elevate his family to the echelons of old money. Despite the frowns and disapproving glances from her father, Rose, with a rebellious heart, married Joseph Kennedy in October 1914 in what can only be described as a modest ceremony, far removed from the grandeur one would expect. But this union was more than just a matrimonial alliance, it was the fusion of two future powerhouses, creating a political dynasty that would dominate American politics. Joseph P. Kennedy Sr., with his sharp business acumen and relentless pursuit of wealth, dabbled in various ventures, including investment-grade real estate, further cementing the Kennedy family's influence and wealth. Rose Kennedy, a product of the influential Fitzgerald family, and her marriage to the astute Joseph P. Kennedy Sr., laid the foundations of a legacy that transcends time. Indeed, this strategic alliance would later be famously emulated by Joseph's son, John F. Kennedy, whose story we'll cover next. Now, Jacqueline Lee Bouvier, born on the 28th of July, 1929, in the affluent town of Southampton, New York, was destined to leave an unforgettable imprint on American history. The daughter of John Bouvier, a Wall Street maven, 
and Janet Bouvier with her illustrious Irish-English lineage, Jackie, along with her sister Caroline Lee, was ushered into the upper echelons of New York City and Long Island society, a world brimming with opulence and privilege. The Bouvier sisters' early years were spent in the grandeur of a 12-room duplex at 740 Park Avenue in Manhattan, and summers were like pages from a fairy tale spent at Lasata, the family estate in East Hampton. Their father, John Vernou Bouvier III, known as Black Jack, with his Clark Gable-esque charm and a reputation as a ladies' man, was their hero. Despite his flirtatious ways and penchant for the bottle, he was a doting father, instilling in his daughters the drive to excel, to be nothing short of the best. And even better, Jackie's childhood was a tapestry woven with cultural and artistic threads. An equestrian prodigy, without a doubt an old money pastime and skill, she claimed national championships by age 11. And her intellectual pursuits were just as formidable. She devoured every children's book on her shelves before even stepping into a school. Her idols were as eclectic as her interests. Mowgli, Robin Hood, little Lord Fauntleroy's grandfather, Scarlett O'Hara, and the poet Lord Byron. Quite naturally, education for Jackie was a journey through prestigious institutions, Miss Chapin's school in New York and Miss Porter's school in Connecticut. She wasn't just a student, she was a beacon of academic and equestrian excellence, often outshining her sister Lee, whose old money grace we'll talk about a bit later. Jackie's quest for knowledge took her to Vassar College, followed by a year in France, immersing herself in its rich culture and history, and culminating with a degree in French literature from George Washington University. But Jackie's sojourn in Paris was more than just an academic endeavor. It was a deep dive into the French way of life, living with the Durenti family and absorbing every nuance of their culture. And her passion for history and culture became a defining element of her public persona. As the First Lady, she was a custodian of the arts, a champion of historic preservation and a cultural ambassador par excellence. Her fluency in French, another secret old money tell, and her affinity for global cultures made her a beloved figure on the world stage. But her marriage to John F. Kennedy on the 12th of September, 1953, at St. Mary's Roman Catholic Church in Newport, Rhode Island, was even more a watershed moment. Jackie, with her old money, elegance and sophistication, didn't just capture the nation's heart, she transformed the Kennedy family's public image. Her style and fashion sensibilities set trends and inspired generations, and Jackie's influence extended far beyond style. Her French connections, her mastery of the language and her love for French culture were instrumental in enhancing US-French relations during Kennedy's presidency. Her charm and diplomatic acumen fostered positive relationships with world leaders, including Charles de Gaulle and Nikita Khrushchev, showcasing her pivotal role in the international political arena. Therefore, without Jackie Kennedy, the family itself would not have nearly as much of an old money ethos from the Camelot imagery we all know and love to the international energy brimming from the Kennedy administration on down to the fashion sense and elegant poise. However, sartorial skill and iconic fashion within the Kennedy lineage only begins with Jackie Kennedy. It doesn't end there. Our next Kennedy icon takes the grace and opulence even further. On the 3rd of March, 1933, in the heart of Manhattan, New York City, Caroline Lee Bouvier, who would later be known as Lee Radziwill, was born. As the younger sister of Jacqueline Kennedy, Lee was cradled in the lap of luxury from the onset. Her childhood, shared with her sister, unfolded in lavish Manhattan apartments and grand estates along the East Coast, a setting that would deeply influence her fashion sensibilities and lifestyle. And even before her sister ascended to the role of First Lady in 1961, Lee's fashion sense was a subject of admiration in the press. Her style was a harmonious blend of clean lines, oversized sunglasses, and effortlessly flowing hair, a stark contrast to the rigid elegance of the 1950s. Indeed, Vogue magazine lauded her for steering American fashion towards a more relaxed yet confident aesthetic. And her timeless fashion choices continue to resonate with designers even today. Thus, Lee's foray into high society and her innate glamour catapulted her to the status of an international socialite and fashion icon. Her sophisticated taste earned her a spot among the world's best-dressed women, and she was a part of Truman Capote's Swan, 
a circle of elegant high society women basking in the intellectual glow that Capote's attention brought, further solidifying her high society status. But Lee's fashion influence wasn't confined to her wardrobe, it extended to her living spaces. She had an uncanny ability to craft iconic living spaces, often infused with Eastern influences and her signature sophisticated pink. Her style garnered admiration from fashion giants like Giorgio Armani, Marc Jacobs, Michael Kors and Carolina Herrera. Despite being in the shadow of her globally renowned sister, Lee's natural glamour shone brightly, making her a fashion icon in her own right. Her style was defined by a love for luxurious jewellery, opulent coats and minimalist attire, cementing her as a central figure in high society for over half a century. And the marriage of Lee Bouvier to Polish aristocrat Prince Stanislaw Albrecht Radziwill in March 1959 was more than a marriage. It was a fusion of wealth and power. The Radziwills, one of Poland's most illustrious families, owned vast estates across Europe, and this union with European nobility further elevated the Kennedy family's standing in high society. Subsequently, in the 1960s, Lee Radziwill became a significant figure in the fashion world, embodying and enhancing the Kennedy family's old money aesthetic. As the sister-in-law of US President John F. Kennedy, Lee was constantly in the public eye. Her personal style a subject of keen observation, and she shared her sister Jacqueline's affinity for elegant and sophisticated clothing, often influenced by French fashion. During this era, the fashion world was in flux, with societal norms being redefined and trends evolving rapidly. While Jacqueline Kennedy pioneered new ground for American fashion, Lee's style evolved alongside these changes. She became synonymous with chic and timeless ensembles, a symbol of high society. Thus, both sisters, Jacqueline and Lee, were and are celebrated as old money style icons. Their fashion choices, from Jacqueline's boxy skirt suits and coordinating accessories to Lee's chic outfits, were emulated by women across the United States and beyond. Their impact on fashion not only defined the old money aesthetic, but also left an enduring legacy on the Kennedy family's image. Next, born in July 1921, Eunice Kennedy Shriver emerged as a luminary in the Kennedy family's philanthropic saga. Her life's mission to uplift those sidelined by society, especially individuals with intellectual disabilities, was deeply rooted in her bond with her elder sister, Rosemary, who herself faced intellectual challenges. In 1957, Shriver assumed the helm of the Joseph P. Kennedy Jr. Foundation, a tribute to her late brother, a casualty of World War II. Under her stewardship, the foundation pivoted from supporting Catholic charities to delving into research on intellectual disabilities, seeking humane treatment methods. Its objectives centered on preventing intellectual disabilities by uncovering their causes and transforming societal approaches to people with these disabilities. Next, Shriver's vision and relentless pursuit of justice blossomed into the Special Olympics movement. In 1968, alongside the Chicago Park District, the Joseph P. Kennedy Jr. Foundation orchestrated the inaugural International Special Olympics Summer Games in Chicago's Soldier Field. This groundbreaking event saw 1,000 athletes with intellectual disabilities from 26 states and Canada compete in athletics. By December 1968, Special Olympics Incorporated was established as a non-profit in the District of Columbia. But Shriver's impact transcended the Special Olympics. She influenced her brother, President John F. Kennedy, to establish a committee on developmental disabilities, leading to the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development at the National Institutes of Health. Her influence also extended to academia, founding centers for medical ethics at Harvard University and Georgetown University. And Shriver's relentless efforts garnered her the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 1984, bestowed by President Ronald Reagan, who lauded her for her contributions to individuals with intellectual disabilities. The genesis of the Special Olympics traces back to the inaugural Camp Shriver in 1962, hosted in Eunice's backyard. This camp was a testament to her commitment to challenging the unjust treatment of people with intellectual disabilities. Next, Eunice's marriage to Sergeant Shriver, a diplomat, politician and activist, melded political clout with old money humanitarian ethos. Sergeant, the architect behind the Peace Corps and the War on Poverty, and Eunice, together for 56 years, 
formed a powerful duo dedicated to social change and empowerment. Eunice's work was not just a professional endeavor, but a personal crusade inspired by her sister Rosemary. Her efforts in politics, government and activism significantly improved lives globally. And Caroline Kennedy, born on the 27th of November 1957 and daughter of President John F. Kennedy and Jacqueline Bouvier Kennedy, began her education in the White House, later attending prestigious schools and earning degrees from Harvard and Columbia Law School. Her career spans writing, editing, law and politics, and Caroline served as a research assistant at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and later in education, significantly aiding New York City schools. Her diplomatic tenure as U.S. Ambassador to Japan from 2010 to 2017 showcased her ability to navigate complex political landscapes, a skill nurtured by her education and early exposure to politics. Additionally, Caroline's charitable endeavors include roles with the Fund for Public Schools and the John F. Kennedy Library Foundation, further cementing her family's legacy of public service and social responsibility. Thus, both Eunice and Caroline's extensive philanthropic and public service efforts helped to solidify the old money ethos of noblesse oblige in the Kennedy lineage, well after the White House had other tenants. And last, Maria Shriver charted a path in journalism that seamlessly wove her family's political legacy with her own media persona. Her zeal for broadcast journalism ignited during her father's 1972 U.S. vice presidential campaign, an experience she later hailed as transformative. Shriver's journalistic journey began at CBS station KYW-TV, led her to anchor the CBS Morning News and eventually to NBC News. Her career was distinguished by a commitment to precise reporting and a firm belief in the narrative's power, earning recognition from Forbes and Time magazine as one of the most influential women in media. In 1986, Shriver married Arnold Schwarzenegger, a union melding political clout with Hollywood glamour. Despite their contrasting political leanings, Shriver, a Democrat, and Schwarzenegger, a Republican, their marriage was pivotal to Schwarzenegger's political ascent, particularly his gubernatorial victory. However, their relationship faced trials, leading to their separation in 2011. But Shriver's advocacy and authorship continued the Kennedy tradition of societal impact. Her father's Alzheimer's diagnosis in 2003 spurred her advocacy for dementia and Alzheimer's research. She founded the Women's Alzheimer's Movement, focusing on why Alzheimer's disproportionately affects women and communities of color. In 2017, her efforts earned her the Alzheimer's Association Lifetime Achievement Award. Her literary contributions, including 10 Things I Wish I'd Known Before I Went Out Into the Real World and The Shriver Report, showcase her commitment to addressing societal issues and sparking conversations. Jean Kennedy Smith, born in February 1928, also embodied the Kennedy family's cultural and societal ethos. In 1974, she founded Very Special Arts, now the VSA, an educational arm of the Kennedy Center, providing creative arts opportunities to persons with disabilities. This endeavor, earning her the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 2011, reflected her belief in arts accessibility for all. Her board memberships at the John F. Kennedy Center and the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace further illustrated the Kennedy's societal commitment. In 1956, Jean married Stephen E. Smith, intertwining the Kennedy lineage with another distinguished American family and their union yielded four children, Stephen Jr., William, Amanda, and Kim. And Jean's cultural impact extended to diplomacy. As U.S. ambassador to Ireland, she played a pivotal role in Northern Ireland's peace process, thus tying into the broader, old money international mentality of giving back. Additionally, Ethel Kennedy, widow of Senator Robert F. Kennedy, has been a beacon in philanthropy and social activism, especially post her husband's tenure. Ethel, embodying the old money Kennedy ethos of political and social engagement, founded the Robert F. Kennedy Center for Justice and Human Rights after his assassination in 1968. This organization collaborates with local activists to promote human rights, living out Robert Kennedy's vision of a just and peaceful world. Even in her 90s, Ethel remains a dynamic figure in various social causes, epitomizing a life dedicated to humanitarianism, echoing the Kennedy legacy of service and social justice. Therefore, we can see that it is really the Kennedy women who are as pivotal to the old money connection with the name Kennedy as the men themselves.
in the perpetually intricate corridors of American history, where whispers of what could have been echo. Few tales resound more poignantly than the tragic tale of John F. Kennedy Jr. For almost a quarter century, America has been haunted by the spectre of possibilities stolen too soon from its grasp. When 1999 saw the heavens claim Kennedy in that fateful plane crash, it wasn't merely a life the nation mourned, it was the potential ascension of a leader, one born of storied lineage, poised to grasp the presidential mantle. In today's episode of Old Money Luxury, we'll traverse the lesser-known avenues of John F. Kennedy Jr.'s life, peeling back layers to reveal a man that many foresaw as the epitome of a would-be old money commander-in-chief. Indeed, JFK Jr. stood at the crossroads, prepared to rekindle the flames of a past Kennedy era, shoulder the immense weight of looming expectations, and perhaps, in a feat that remains elusive to many, mend the ever-widening chasms of our contemporary political landscape. Born into the very spotlight that would follow him all his days, John F. Kennedy Jr. made his debut in a nation entranced by the Kennedys, especially given the recent election of his father as president. His birth wasn't merely a familial celebration, it was a national proclamation. As the first child of an incumbent president to be born in the storied halls of the White House, John Jr. didn't just add to the Kennedy Chronicles, he cemented them further in the annals of American law. Indeed, the birth of this young Kennedy heralded hope and anticipation for a decade on the cusp of transformation. Yet, before he could even conjure memories of the father who held the nation's highest office, fate delivered a crushing blow. The assassination of President Kennedy in Dallas tore through the heart of America, and in a moment captured for eternity, young John Jr., aged all of three years, offered a salute to his father's passing procession, crafting an image that transcended its time. And this wasn't merely an image of personal loss, it was a mirror to a nation in mourning. Though too tender to grasp the intricacies of the political maelstrom, his poignant act rendered him a beacon of fortitude, forever shaping public perception. In the aftermath, as John Jr. and his sister Caroline navigated the labyrinth of youth, their mother, the enigmatic Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis, orchestrated a life away from the prying eyes of Washington. Within New York's discreet educational sanctuaries, John Jr. flourished, academically and athletically. Still, his allure lay not just in his talents, but in his unassuming, authentic demeanor, a quality often rare in one born to such prominence, except for, perhaps, a Kennedy. As the sands of time shifted, another facet of John Jr. emerged, the fervent advocate for equality, a trait undoubtedly passed down from his illustrious parents. For him, the legendary Kennedy name wasn't a shroud to hide behind, but a torch to carry forward, marking his earnest endeavors in the realm of public service. Now in the heart of his formative years, John F. Kennedy Jr. chose to attend Brown University, a bastion alive with the fervor of thought and impassioned activism. American studies became his academic compass, a nod to his insatiable quest to unravel the intricate fabric of a nation his forebears had left a monumental mark upon. Jackie Kennedy Onassis, the ever-present matriarch, subtly orchestrated a supportive backdrop during this phase. Her letters to his educators and her discreet interventions painted the portrait of a mother, ensuring her son's journey through academia wasn't without its anchors. Though John's natural charm could illuminate any gathering, he bore the propensity for distraction, a trait Jackie tirelessly sought to temper. But it was never about preferential treatment. It was about instilling in him the reverence for erudition. The culmination of his collegiate years in 1983 bore witness to John's tenacity and the unwavering maternal support shadowing him. Emerging from the cloistered realm of university, John found himself ensnared in the opulent web of New York's elite. His name, both a crown and a cross to bear, made him a magnet for tabloids. Soirees, philanthropic galas, and rendezvous at the city's most luminescent venues saw him reveling in a life many could only conjure in dreams. Yet beneath this veneer, he wrestled with the colossal specter of being a Kennedy. To John, Jackie Kennedy Onassis was more than just a mother. She was the North Star, the moral tether guiding him through life's vast ocean. She inculcated a creed where public service transcended familial obligation, elevating it to a revered duty. After her passing in 1994, 
a missive she left became his lodestar, illuminating the singular role he and Caroline were destined to play in the annals of time. Thus, the succeeding years bore the unmistakable imprint of Jackie's ethos. John, by then a beacon in the public eye with inclinations towards benevolence, commandeered the editorial ship of George magazine. Steering his innate magnetism towards purposeful discourse and societal concerns mirrored the path his mother had envisioned for him. Observers noted, as he resumed his duties at George shortly after laying his mother to rest, that his actions echoed what Jackie herself might have ordained. Therefore, John's endeavors post his mother's demise bore witness to a child grappling with a monumental legacy while forging a distinct trajectory. Though fate denied him the canvas to fully paint his vision, the foundation he left behind speaks volumes. However, in the winding path of John F. Kennedy Jr.'s pursuits, the legal realm wasn't one easily conquered. Only after navigating the bar exam on his third attempt did he truly embrace the world of law. His subsequent role as an assistant district attorney in the bustling heart of Manhattan, with a focus on prosecuting the more violent transgressions, was far from arbitrary. It called for a discerning grasp of justice's delicate balance. John's unwavering commitment to his duties saw him emerge as a prosecutor of formidable resolve, yet tempered by a thoughtful pursuit of equitable judgment. By 1995, the siren call of journalism beckoned John Jr. The result, George Magazine, a curated tapestry of politics, the arts, and the opulence of celebrity existence. Far from being a mere addition to the pantheon of publications, it encapsulated John's eclectic fascinations. Resonating with both the echelons of power and the populace, it emerged as a beacon of critical acclaim and commercial prowess. Next, the year 1996 ushered in a personal milestone, a marriage with Carolyn Bassett, a connoisseur of public relations. The spectacle, far from being a quiet affair, catapulted into the media's voracious gaze. Nestled on Cumberland Island, with a historic church as a backdrop, bedecked in nature's floral finery, their nuptials became the talk of the nation. Yet it also underscored the persistent conundrum of fame, the relentless quest for privacy amid a ceaseless public scrutiny. With the wane of the 1990s, whispers of John Jr.'s political horizon began to permeate the air. Given his potent amalgamation of public stature, familial heritage, and a palpable zeal for civic duty, such speculations were foregone conclusions. The undercurrent suggested that John Jr. might transcend the domains of journalism or law and ascend to political prominence. Though he never publicly voiced any political aspirations, the canvas of potentialities was vast, perhaps the gubernatorial helm of New York, or even the presidential mantle on 2004's horizon. On a sunny day in the middle of July 1999, the nation was gripped by a chilling pallor upon hearing the heart-wrenching news. A plane crash that snuffed out the lives of John F. Kennedy Jr., his beloved wife Carolyn Bessett Kennedy, and her sister Lauren Bessett. Setting off from New Jersey, their destination was Martha's Vineyard, aboard a Piper Saratoga aircraft. John's plan was simple, to set Lauren ashore at Martha's Vineyard before proceeding with Carolyn to the iconic Kennedy Haven in Hyannisport, where Rory Kennedy's wedding awaited. But destiny had other plans. Data traces painted a grim picture. The aircraft's descent, alarmingly swift from 2,200 feet to a mere 1,100 feet in a brief 14-second span, before it dissolved into oblivion. An extensive rescue mission then unfolded, mobilizing the Coast Guard, Navy, Air Force, and a sea of civilian Samaritans. However, as hope dwindled over two days, the mission somberly transitioned from rescue to recovery. It was on the 21st of July that Navy divers finally pieced together the tragic tableau, retrieving the lost souls from the watery abyss, 116 feet deep, roughly eight nautical miles from Martha's Vineyard. Subsequent probes ruled out technical or navigational anomalies. The National Transportation Safety Board's inference was poignant in its simplicity. John Jr., a pilot still finding his wings, probably grappled with disorientation amid the enveloping darkness and fog, leading to the fatal loss of control. A profound melancholy echoed across the nation, signaling a mournful finale to another chapter of the storied Kennedy saga. The annals of tragedy that have shadowed this illustrious clan seem to weigh even heavier on the collective psyche, amplifying the nation's lament. 
In John, they mourned not just another Kennedy child, but a beacon of aspirations, hope, and an enduring legacy. The subsequent funeral on the 23rd of July bore witness to an intimate gathering at Manhattan's Church of St. Thomas More, a sanctuary often frequented by John's late, elegant mother, Jackie Kennedy Onassis. Among the mourners were the then incumbents of the White House, President Bill Clinton and First Lady Hillary Rodham Clinton. The Kennedy patriarch, Senator Ted Kennedy, in his poignant eulogy, delineated John's duality as both a cherished family member and a symbol for a nation, embodying a legacy yet carving his distinct narrative. In the ensuing weeks, the specifics of John Jr.'s life, interwoven with the tragedy of his demise, became ubiquitous. News forums, print chronicles and communal dialogues were rife with tributes. A gamut of society, from political stalwarts and luminaries to the very heart of America, poured forth their condolences. This somber period crystallized reflections on life's ephemeral nature, the sacrifices innate to public duty, and a chapter's closure for the Kennedy lineage. Indeed, the abrupt departure of John F. Kennedy Jr. in 1999 sent ripples through the nation's psyche, creating a vacuum in the fabric of American political and societal spheres. As time stretched its canvas, the profundity of John's lingering influence crystallized not merely as a cultural titan, but as the embodiment of a tantalizing political what-if. With the advent of the 21st century, curiosity surrounding John's life and potential has resurged. Scholars and intellectuals, including the likes of Gillen, who meticulously chronicled Kennedy's journey, pondered the intriguing divergence between the John of George magazine and a hypothetical President Kennedy. These analytical musings, though rooted in speculation, afforded glimpses into the magnitude of influence and leadership John might have cast upon America's destiny. And a newer generation, unfamiliar with the tumultuous Kennedy era, has grown captivated by John Jr.'s allure. By the 2020s, questions long simmering in hushed conversations and academic circles have attained prominence. Might John F. Kennedy Jr. have been a unifying linchpin in an era of pronounced political chasms? Debates have flourished, with some envisioning him as a transformative figure fusing disparate American ideologies, while others see a figure grounded in democratic doctrines, but not necessarily radical. But amidst this cacophony of conjectures, one sentiment has resonated unanimously. John F. Kennedy Jr. epitomized the path untraveled, a vibrant promise both tantalizing and elusive. Though the contours of John F. Kennedy Jr.'s potential path remain shrouded in mystery, his potent blend of heritage, allure, and genuine intent hinted at a legacy of significance. In his echoing presence, we are perennially beckoned to confront the poignant query intrinsic to all tales of premature deaths. What might the world have witnessed? In the storied landscape of American history, the Kennedy family saga holds a special place, with the unexpected financial rise of Joseph P. Kennedy Sr. at its core. Indeed, Kennedy Sr., a master of finance and business, wove a complex web of investments and strategies that not only built an empire, but also shaped the destiny of his illustrious lineage. In today's episode, we document Joseph P. Kennedy Sr.'s meteoric ascent in the financial world, looking into the specifics of his initial forays into the stock market, alongside his bold ventures in real estate and Hollywood. Undoubtedly, his financial acumen laid the foundation for the Kennedy family's rise to prominence, but it is also often veiled in mystery and speculation, and has long been a topic of both admiration and controversy. With that said, we'll uncover that, all here and now, the good, the bad, and the luxury of the Kennedy wealth, as we describe Joseph P. Kennedy, Sr., and the origins of the Kennedy wealth. Joseph P. Kennedy, Sr. was quite the enigma in the world of finance, dazzling Wall Street with his Midas touch. His story reads like a how-to guide on wealth building, albeit with a sprinkle of controversy. Kennedy's adventure with stocks started in 1919 at the Boston office of the Hayden Stone Investment House, a fertile ground for his budding financial sagacity. Under the keen tutelage of Stone, Kennedy not only grasped the intricacies of the stock market, but also began to invest his personal capital. By the mid-1920s, his reputation for financial wizardry was cemented, thanks to his sharp mind, unflagging diligence, and possibly some hush-hush insider info. 
Critics whispered of shady tactics, wash sales and short selling, but back then such moves were on the right side of legal, and Kennedy defended himself as a shrewd speculator. A stroke of genius was his anticipation of the 1929 stock market crash. Kennedy, sensing the impending doom, started to pull out his investments in 1928, sailing through the financial storm unscathed. By the time the dust settled, his fortune had ballooned from $4 million at the crash to a whopping $180 million by 1935, padded by real estate and some say insider trading. Indeed, this period wasn't without its share of raised eyebrows. Kennedy's rapid wealth accumulation and rumored insider knowledge led to allegations of market manipulation. Gossip mills churned out stories of a tip-off from a Federal Reserve Board insider, which Kennedy stoutly denied, and no evidence ever surfaced to substantiate these claims. Even more interestingly, in an era when insider trading laws were as clear as mud, Kennedy's actions might not have been as cut and dry illicit as they would be today. Yet, in a twist of fate, or perhaps poetic justice, Kennedy became the inaugural chairman of the Securities and Exchange Commission, or the SEC, in 1934, appointed by none other than President Franklin D. Roosevelt. And Kennedy Sr.'s tenure at the SEC was marked by foundational work in establishing regulations that would later inform modern insider trading laws, although these rules didn't crystallize into law until after Kennedy's time at the SEC. With that said, stocks and trades were only the tip of the iceberg when it came to Joseph P. Kennedy Sr.'s portfolio, for as many of us know, one of the keys to sustained wealth is the magic word of diversification. Let's next look at how the Kennedy wealth soon thereafter started to stretch far and wide. Indeed, in the high-stakes world of real estate, Joseph P. Kennedy Sr.'s portfolio was nothing short of impressive. With a flair for the bold, Kennedy not only held majority ownership in Miami's Hialeah racetrack, but also cleverly orchestrated the purchase of the Merchandise Mart in Chicago. And this wasn't just any building. It was the largest in the world at the time, a veritable behemoth in the landscape of commerce. And Kennedy's prowess in real estate investment itself was equally notable. His foray into the sector through Old Colony Realty Associates Incorporated saw him snapping up distressed properties across the United States, turning them into profitable ventures. This was not just a hobby, but a lucrative endeavor, with Kennedy turning over significant profits. Thus, his knack for real estate played a pivotal role in amassing his fortune. A case in point was the sale of the Somerset franchise, which netted him a cool $8.5 million. Adjusted for inflation, that's a jaw-dropping sum north of $100 million today. By 1957, Kennedy's fortune was estimated to be up to $400 million, placing him as the 19th wealthiest person in the US. That's about $3.5 billion in today's dough. But Kennedy's Midas touch wasn't confined to real estate. Between 1926 and 1930, he left an unforgettable mark on Hollywood, running not one, not two, but three film studios. His entry into Tinseltown in 1919 was driven by a belief in the lucrative potential of motion pictures, and Kennedy wasn't just a passive investor. He actively reorganized and refinanced several studios, including the film booking offices of America, which he acquired for a mere $1.5 million. He also took over the Keith Albee Orpheum Theatres Corporation, boasting over 700 vaudeville and movie theatres. And his influence extended beyond simple ownership. Kennedy was a master of financial engineering, contributing significantly to his wealth. Therefore, his tenure in Hollywood was marked by a laser focus on the financial and production aspects, setting a precedent for the modern-day studio system where bankers, not filmmakers, hold the reins. With that said, you now know some of the moving parts of Joseph P. Kennedy Sr.'s wealth at the time it was accumulated. Let's next break down exactly how rich he would have been if he grew up in the present era. In the history of American business and politics, indeed few figures have etched a legend as compelling as Joseph P. Kennedy Sr., by the time he bid adieu to this world in 1969, his coffers were bulging with an estimated $500 million per the New York Times. That's no chump change, even by today's standards. It's roughly $3.2 billion when adjusted for inflation. And the Kennedy treasure chest wasn't just stuffed with greenbacks. It was a maze of trusts, ranging from the modest tens of thousands to whopping $25 million entities. 
This shrewd asset juggling meant that the family's riches didn't just survive him. They thrived, with Forbes clocking the extended clan's wealth at a cool $1 billion these days. Now, Kennedy Sr.'s financial wizardry wasn't just for show, it was the linchpin of his political clout. For example, amid the economic turmoil of the Great Depression, he was building an empire, dabbling in real estate and Hollywood, as we mentioned, and setting up million-dollar trust funds for his nine offspring. The result, as we know, was a brood not shackled by the need to make a buck, free to chase their political dreams. And Kennedy Sr.'s influence wasn't limited to his children's bank accounts. During the New Deal days, he was a rare business titan, backing Franklin Roosevelt's presidential ambitions. This indeed was a game-changer for the iconic president, leading FDR to appoint Joseph Kennedy Sr. as the inaugural chairman of the Securities and Exchange Commission. Therefore, much like any tech billionaire we see using their wealth to gain political muscle and sway away the focus of thorns in their side like congressional hearings, Joseph P. Kennedy Sr.'s wealth was a crucial arrow in his quiver at building an old money dynasty for himself and his descendants. However, we're merely scratching the surface when it comes to exactly how Joe Kennedy used money to gain influence. Let's go a bit deeper and discuss how he used this to make the name Kennedy synonymous with American royalty, as it were. In the Kennedy clan, the patriarch's deep pockets were a pivotal factor, shaping the destinies of his offspring. Joseph P. Kennedy Sr., an individual whose wealth was as vast as his ambitions, generously funded political endeavors, initially backing other Democrats like Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Subsequently, his coffers were channeled to support the careers of his progeny. And his second son, John F. Kennedy, reaped the benefits of this financial windfall. As one of the United States' most affluent presidents, JFK had the rare privilege of donating his presidential earnings to charity, a gesture made feasible by his family's considerable resources. For sure, the affluence of Joseph P. Kennedy Sr. undeniably sculpted the lives of his children. For young Jack, Bobby, Teddy and their siblings, life was a blend of opulence and expectation, as dazzling as it was demanding. Summer camps, more like European tours and private tutors who were more worldly than most university professors. And JFK and Robert, in particular, were marinated in an ethos of success from the get-go. Their father's wealth meant they could attend the best schools. Think Harvard, not your average local high school. They rubbed elbows with society's creme de la creme, learning the art of power and politics at dinner tables instead of in classrooms. Indeed, growing up in a world where financial worries were foreign, they had the liberty to chase their passions unencumbered by monetary concerns. Yet this silver spoon came with its share of complications. The dubious rumors surrounding the Kennedy fortune's origins occasionally cast a pall, which we'll discuss more in depth in the next chapter. And it attracted not just admiration, but also scrutiny and controversy. So in essence, Joseph P. Kennedy Sr.'s largesse was both a boon and a bane for the Kennedy lineage, propelling them onto the public stage while simultaneously weaving a narrative of wealth, power, and the accompanying shadow of speculation, which we shall now discuss. Now, of course, in the high-stakes world of historical myths, the tale of Joseph P. Kennedy Sr.'s supposed bootlegging empire during Prohibition stands out like a sore thumb at a white-glove luncheon. Despite its popularity in the court of public opinion, this narrative is about as robust as a house of cards in a hurricane, according to the sharper minds in the history biz. David Nasor, the veritable Sherlock Holmes of Kennedy lore, has scoured the archives and found zilch to suggest that Joe Kennedy was the Al Capone of the East Coast. In the same vein, Daniel Okrant, another heavyweight in the ring of historical detective war, throws cold water on the idea that Kennedy was a moonshine maestro. But how did this urban legend get its legs? Flashback to the 1960s, the era of skinny ties and political mudslinging. As JFK hustled for the presidency, his opponents painted his father as a bootlegging baron, indeed a story juicier than a ripe peach in summer. Adding spice to the stew, characters like Frank Costello, who would have boasted about sharing a barber with Kennedy if it got him attention, claimed they were in cahoots during the dry years. Academia, however, gives these tales the eye roll they deserve. According to them, in reality, Joseph Kennedy was more Warren Buffett than Bugsy Siegel. He turned the merchandise mart in Chicago into his golden goose.
dabbled successfully in the world of horse racing in Miami and had his fingers in so many pies that he could have started a bakery. Certainly his portfolio was as diverse as a New York City subway car at rush hour. So, while the image of Kennedy Sr. as a Prohibition-era Pablo Escobar makes for a gripping yarn, the truth is likely he was just a savvy businessman with a golden touch. He played the stock market like a Stradivarius, turned real estate into gold, and when Fortune magazine tallied up the big fish in 1957, there he was, swimming with the sharks in the millionaire's pool. However, it is indeed crucial to note that while much of the lore around Joe Kennedy's wealth has been debunked, there remain shaded corners and hushed whispers that have yet to be fully illuminated. We certainly do not know the full truth about where Joseph P. Kennedy Sr.'s wealth came from, and some admittedly very smart people have speculated whether the darker, unexplored aspects of Joe Kennedy's wealth and connections might have played a role in the tragic early demise of his son, JFK. While these conjectures often tread the fine line between reality and fiction, they underscore a broader truth about history. It's often more complex and multi-layered than it appears. In the case of the Kennedys, the intersection of immense wealth, political power and personal tragedy has created an almost Shakespearean drama that continues to captivate and confound. When you hear someone conjure the currently viral trends of the old money aesthetic, quiet luxury or old money style, there are many brands, celebrities and looks you can evoke. If you're going 21st century with things, you can discuss the brand Lauro Piana, Gwyneth Paltrow and the sleek contours of the cashmere set. Alternatively, you could take a dip in the dark academia themes of Instagram and TikTok fame. However, those in the know first and foremost always return back to one name when they discuss how the old money aesthetic first came out of the boarding school dorms and off of the prep school greens before making its way onto the streets of New York, Paris and Milan. And that name is quite naturally Kennedy. Thus, in today's video at Old Money Luxury, We'll give you a step-by-step -step deep dive highlighting the style choices of the two most iconic Kennedys, JFK and Jackie. Focusing on brand choice, fit, formal versus casual and much more as we take you inside the old money aesthetic of the Kennedys. Let's begin our journey with perhaps the least confusing and easily reproducible aspect of how the Kennedys embodied the old money style. The suits of President John F. Kennedy. As we'll see, his choices regarding how to style his suits were even more markedly old money than the fashion staples of his new money father, Joseph P. Kennedy Sr., who enjoyed louder, more ostentatious fittings and aesthetics for his wardrobe. However, Jack Kennedy himself not only went for a more classy, elegant look than his old man, JFK did it so well that he is one of the fundamental inspirations for why the preppy old money look has become so synonymous with the upper rungs of American society. Now, in his role as president, JFK shook things up in many ways, but his sartorial preferences remained traditional. The man was unwavering in his commitment to the two-piece suit, a staple of the old money political class. Yet, Kennedy's approach was distinct. He tightened it all up, preferring slim-fitting suits with none of those chunky shoulder pads, instead opting for neatly tailored Ivy League designs. Narrow lapels, subtle patterns, and a razor-sharp trouser crease were his signature. Additionally, to be more specific about brand choice, Brooks Brothers and the Kennedys go together like tea and biscuits in my native Britain, a connection that forged a fashionable legacy in the 1960s. You can picture the scene, September 1953, Kennedy's wedding day, where he chose to present his groomsmen with monogrammed Brooks Brothers umbrellas. His loyalty to the brand reportedly even extended to his choice of Blue Brooks Brothers boxes. Now that's dedication to a brand. Thus JFK's style was both streamlined and chic. Worsted wool was his fabric of choice, tailored to perfection. In fact, Kennedy's rejection of the double-breasted suit was so famous that even his press secretary, Pierre Salinger, once amusingly responded to an inquiry about it, saying, the president is too far gone to reform him on his wearing apparel, and he is definitely not a double-breasted suit man. Therefore, Kennedy's suits were models of old money, with a touch of modern elegance, ventless jackets, slim flapped or jetted hip pockets, and small soft shoulders gave his wardrobe a signature flair. Even smaller details, like the number of cuff buttons, had a role in his timeless look. However, ever the new frontier pioneer, 
John F. Kennedy sometimes wore both buttons on his two-button jackets, disregarding the general fashion rule. Now, color-wise, his suits were a robust palette of grays and blues, never straying from these two authoritative hues. Blue, a color often linked with confidence, power, and youth, suited Kennedy, the youngest president in six decades, and the occasional charcoal gray added a touch of professionalism, a wise choice for a commander-in-chief. And then there were the trousers. Kennedy's suit trousers were tailored masterpieces, flat front with slim legs, cuffed bottoms, and a medium to full break over his shoes. Most were accompanied by a black leather belt, hidden beneath his jacket, but occasionally spotted in candid photographs. In essence, JFK's style was a remarkable blend of old money Ivy League tradition and individual flair, a sophisticated take on a classic theme. However, when mentioning the name Kennedy and style in the same breath, it's really the president's wife who should rightly get the lion's share of attention. Now, it really should go without saying that Jackie Kennedy's fashion sense was so iconic that she is undoubtedly the most stylish person to ever hold the address, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, man or woman. Her looks weren't about merely keeping up with the trends. Instead, Jackie Kennedy's dresses in particular were the trend. Now, for the purposes of this video, the essence of her dress style is best understood through the prism of what we now call the old money aesthetic. A phrase that, much like Jackie herself, evokes timeless elegance and supreme class. For example, cast your mind back to JFK's inauguration day. During that historic event, soon-to-be First Lady graced the world with a beige coat dress, designed by the Paris-born aristocrat Oleg Cassini, a Holston pillbox hat, and elbow-length gloves. These items themselves would later set significant fashion trends in the swinging 60s. Now, the beige Oleg Cassini coat dress, while made of humble wool, was cut with a flair that mirrored Paris couture with its A-line silhouette and standaway collar. Additionally, her color choice of beige resonates with the old money style as an emblem of understated class, a hue that doesn't beg for attention but rather commands respect, much like her husband's fastidious adherence to neutral power colors in his suits. Thus, beige and other neutral shades subtly alludes to wealth without flaunting it, a principle at the heart of the old money aesthetic. However, oversized pockets and buttons on the coat dress indeed added a smattering of Hollywood glam to Jackie's ensemble. This again ties into how both Kennedys would take the classic old money look and add just a smidgen of original risk-taking to bring together the perfect moments for fashion and world history. Of course, Roy Holston Froick, or simply Holston, a name that shot to fame in the 70s, played a part here. An American designer who knew the art of blending minimalism with luxury, his designs redefined American fashion with a focus on quality materials and a clean, elegant line that perfectly synced with the old money style. The Holston pillbox hat Jackie wore that inauguration day is an enduring symbol of this approach. Minimalist, yet supremely chic, it encapsulated the sophistication of the entire look. And while we're on the topic of Jackie's dresses, let's not forget the pre-inauguration gala on January 19, 1961. Here, she dazzled the cameras in an ivory evening gown, another masterpiece from Cassini. Crafted from double-faced silk satin twill, the gown was simplicity made splendid, accented with a ribbon cockade symbolizing her French ancestry. And why is this dress a shining beacon of old money style? It starts with the ivory color, again playing to the aesthetic's fondness for understated elegance. Additionally, there are the gown's sleek lines and rich fabric, exhibiting an unapologetic focus on quality and timeless design. Finally, there's the cockade, a personal and historical nod that speaks volumes about the Kennedys' appreciation for old money European tradition and heritage. Thus, while JFK kept things understated but powerful, Jackie always managed to exude a subtle but eye-waveringly elegant decor. This mixture of challenging norms while still maintaining an allegiance to tradition was embodied by their leadership of a nation and consequently of the fashion world. However, as many fashion experts will tell you, the old money aesthetic isn't simply about power suits and glamorous gowns. In fact, the style you choose when the cameras aren't on you often says more about how truly old money you are than when everyone's watching. Now, when JFK was on vacation, his wardrobe exemplified the Ivy League and preppy aesthetics, and thus his casual outfits showcased a refined yet relaxed look. Off-duty dressing for JFK wasn't merely a matter of throwing on something comfortable, 
It was a nuanced, carefully considered extension of his public persona, one that married the Ivy League aesthetic with the New England old money ethos. With that said, let's break down the Kennedy casual. Starting with the knitwear. JFK's knitwear was a pronounced feature, and if you wanted to find an epitome of preppy style, look no further than his fine knit jumpers. Casually slung about his shoulders, they screamed nonchalant elegance. Particularly, his navy shawl neck cardigan has passed into the annals of style legend. This wasn't just a garment, it was a statement of classy comfort, a nod to the old money's fondness for timeless fashion. Even his grey mile sweatshirts, seemingly ordinary, were worn with a utilitarian charm that an old money preppy patriarch could imbue. Therefore, it's not just what he wore, but how he wore it. His choices reflected a meticulous attention to detail, even in leisure, that spoke volumes about the man and his station. Then we reached the polo shirts, another staple in Kennedy's wardrobe. To JFK, the term casual was never synonymous with careless. The collared polo shirts were a symbol of smart casualness, portraying the image of a leader even in his downtime. It indubitably was about maintaining an air of command without the stiffness of formal attire. Here, the future president decided to indulge in a touch of flamboyance with his color choices. Blues and yellows, bolder than his work shirting but still elegantly restrained, gave a glimpse of the man behind the statesman. And let's not overlook the chinos. The quintessential Ivy League icon, JFK's choice of stone or white chinos, served to distance himself from the gray or navy of his work suits. They were more than just trousers, they were an affirmation of his youth, his connection to the new generation, yet steeped in the time-honored traditions of the Ivy League style. These chinos, often worn with leather loafers, evoke an image of relaxed sophistication that's quintessentially preppy. Thus, the John F. Kennedy casual Ivy League style isn't just about clothing, it's a manifestation of an elite academic tradition, one that speaks of intellect, heritage, and a sense of being part of an esteemed echelon of society. Similarly, Jackie Kennedy was not only the epitome of elegance during formal occasions, but also managed to encapsulate the same grace and poise in her casual attire. Her choices were far from accidental. Each item was a deliberate nod to the old money or preppy woman style, a fashion philosophy that prizes subtlety, quality and timeless chic. With that said, let's explore the key elements that defined Jackie Kennedy's casual style. First, her white trousers. An emblem of sophistication, Jackie was often seen in white trousers, a choice that lent a touch of elegance even to the most informal settings. Consider her appearance in white trousers coupled with a trim blouse during her time in the White House, effortlessly blending the purity of the shade with the casual grace of her demeanor. And when it came to comfort meeting chic, you'd catch Jackie in her crew neck jumpers. Perfect for casual gatherings or solitary reflections, these jumpers were more than mere clothing. They were an expression of her character, refined, composed, yet entirely at ease with herself. Additionally, shift dresses were another staple in her wardrobe. Simple yet elegant, these dresses symbolized the old money look, where Grace never has to shout to be noticed. Whether hosting intimate gatherings or merely enjoying a day to herself, Jackie's shift dresses were an embodiment of understated charm. Furthermore, even her choice of footwear spoke volumes. During vacations, she would often wear canvas sneakers, a seemingly ordinary choice. Yet in her selection, they transcended the mundane and became a symbol of relaxed yet conscious style, never allowing leisure to become a synonym for carelessness. Similarly, versatile and eternally classic, Jackie's fondness for striped shirts was a testament to her understanding of fashion's core principles. Take, for instance, her vacationing attire at the Kennedy compound in Massachusetts in 1953, where she was spotted wearing chic shorts and a button-down shirt, an outfit so effortlessly stylish that it still resonates with the fashion conscious today. Thus, the old money look is more than fashion. It's a philosophy. From her white trousers' pristine elegance to the relaxed grace of her canvas sneakers, Jackie Kennedy's casual style was a masterclass in this philosophy. And last, as ever, the devil is in the details. In the world of fashion, particularly the old money or preppy style, indeed the accessories and fine touches often paint the full picture. 
Both JFK and Jackie Kennedy knew this well, and their selection of accessories was as thoughtful as it was stylish. For example, JFK, a man dripping with humble power and subtle prestige, was rarely seen without a neatly folded white handkerchief in his welted breast pocket. But this was not some flamboyant flourish, rather it was executed with precision, allowing just the tip of the folded point to show, a white speck against the grey or blue canvas of his suit. A subtle touch, yes, but one that conveyed a controlled elegance. Then there were his ties, slimmer and often striped, a break from the more ostentatious neckwear of his father's generation. These details were not mere afterthoughts, but integral to JFK's old money aesthetic. And what of Jackie Kennedy, the first lady of fashion? Her accessory game was quite simply unmatched. The headscarves, adding that touch of glamour and sophistication even to her casual looks, became a signature. They were emblematic of her grace, transforming the ordinary into the extraordinary. But it's her sunglasses that perhaps best define her sense of style. Jackie Kennedy's collection was a treasure trove of brands and shapes. From Nina Ricci to Francois Pinton, from round to hexagonal, her sunglasses were as varied as they were voguish. One iconic pair, the Jackie One sunglasses by Francois Pinton, with their large round tortoise shell frame, remain etched in fashion history. And, of course, the pearls. Pearls are always appropriate, she famously said, a sentiment reflected in her choice of necklaces. Often seen wearing a triple-strand white pearl necklace, believe it or not, Jackie's pearls were not always even authentic. But for a heroine of such eternal elegance, this mattered not. A strand of fakes she purchased for $1.35 became a symbol of her style, eventually auctioned for a staggering $212,000. Despite their authenticity, Jackie wore her pearls with pride, whether greeting world leaders or tending to her children. Therefore, in their accessories, both JFK and Jackie Kennedy guided us through an elegant dance of fashion, one that respected tradition but was never enslaved by it. A dance that took the preppy old money style and made it accessible, yet always aspirational. One that, I dare say, continues to inspire to this very day. And now we'd like to see you in the comments. What do you believe is the most iconic look from each of the Kennedys, JFK and Jackie Kennedy? In other words, what's your favourite outfit from each of them? We can't wait to hear from you. See you then, and cheers until next time from us here at Old Money Luxury.